And um, once we get the This the meeting report, is being recorded. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the uh, LA City Health Commission uh, August uh, 9th. I think today's the 9th, right? Uh, meeting. Um, and uh, we're honored to have some uh, excellent presenters. Uh, will the city clerk call the roll call, please? Thank you. Commissioner Avila. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Stratus. Absent at the moment. Commissioner Gavidia. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Grimmig. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Hisserick. I see him. John, can you unmute, please? I can uh, scroll back up to him. Uh, Commissioner Cato is absent tonight. Commissioner Kalfani. Not joined yet. Commissioner Lemos. Uh, Commissioner Mandel. Present. Thank you. Commissioner Ossi. Present. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Pack is absent tonight. Commissioner Shannon. He has not joined yet. Commissioner Sarota. Present. Thank you. And back up to Commissioner Hisrick. I'm, I'm here. I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can okay. hear you now. Thank you. Uh, seven members present at this time. Commissioner Mandel on the quorum. Thank you very much. Do we uh, have the minutes approved? I'll move approval of the minutes. Do I have a second? Second. Second approval. So, uh, Commissioner Avila and Commissioner Sharota. Thank you. It was actually history, but that's all right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> we got three people saying. Okay. Thank you. And I can go through the roll for that. Commissioner Please. Avila. On the motion to approve the minutes. Who are you asking? Uh, Commissioner Avila? Yes. Oh. Yes. Thank you. Yes, Commissioner motion. Estratus is out. Commissioner Gavidia? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Grimmick? Approved. Commissioner Hisserick? Yes. Commissioner Kofani? Uh, Commissioner Lamos? Uh, Commissioner Mandel? Approved. Thank you. Commissioner Ossi? Abstain, I was, was not present at the last meeting. Correct, thank you. Uh, Commissioner Shannon? Um, yes. Thank you, and Commissioner Sorota? Approved. Thank you, and that motion to approve the minutes is approved. And then, um, Erica, also, uh, Commissioner Shannon's here now, so you can include her in as, the, as being present for the... Uh, thank you. Sorry, I kept getting an error code when I tried to get on another device. Nope, no problem. It's good. Great. Thank you. I will note that. Do we have anybody from the Neighborhood Council to present? Seeing none from the Neighborhood uh, Council for uh, voicing their comments. Uh, anybody in the public arena in the waiting room for the uh, public comment? We have two people in the waiting room, and I can welcome the first speaker. And if I, if I may read uh, the instructions first, in case others are just listening. Thank you. Members of the public who would like to offer public comment on the items listed on the agenda should call 1-669-254-5252 and use meeting ID number 161-909-7326 and press pound. Press pound again when prompted for participant ID. And once admitted into the meeting, press star 9 to request to speak. Great. I'll welcome in our first speaker. Good evening, speaker. You're on the line with the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Caller with a phone number ending in 928. Please press star 6 to unmute yourself and state your name and the agenda item you're speaking on. My name is Justin. 
and I'd like to speak on item two and then a general public comment, please. I'll be four minutes. You may now commence. Thank you. First, I would like to ask, instead of appointing a czar to track homeless people, what are we going to do when there's a whole lot of new homeless people coming from the moratoriums when the evictions start coming in again? I think it's a waste of resources to track folks and start looking at why the population is exploding. And we kind of know why some of them will be. And I just think it's a waste of resources, to be honest with you. And I'd like to do my general public comment, please, and then I will yield the rest of my time. I, I'm not one for civic engagement, so I'm not used to this. I find it really disturbing that it's really hard to track um, Nuri's special item ordinance movement um, regarding vaccine status. I don't understand why. Uh, is it up to the public to play a guessing game in order to track their items, that especially items that greatly affect people's lives? And um, and I'm saying, you know, if you, this meeting were held in person and people were allowed there, I guarantee the place would be packed, okay? And I really hope that there's some kind of transparency here where we can get it, where everybody knows, everybody knows exactly what's going on. We know what day, what's being voted on before any vote is being held. Thank you. I use the rest of my time. Thank you for uh, coming to the uh, LA City Health Commission. We appreciate you uh, involving yourself uh, and commenting uh, on our agenda. The next speaker. Uh, good evening, speaker. Uh, you are now on the line with the Los Angeles City Health Commission. Caller with a phone number ending in 075. Please press star six to unmute yourself and state your name and the agenda item you are speaking on. Thank you. My name is Estella Suarez Hamilton. The man you just spoke to is my love, Justin, and he is actually a director of the Gay Freedom Band. So he's a, he's a really good guy, okay? So listen to him. Now I want to talk about item two and item four and a public comment, please. I'm speaking. You have four minutes. Thank you. Bless you. For item two, I wanted to talk about Rise Together. I did a little bit of online looking, and I saw that they are involved in a lot of surveillance for police. I don't really think a lot of people would feel good about that if they knew that part. Also, they're not a non-for-profit. They want to track homeless people in 18 months, which I believe is unconstitutional. And I know they're not a non-profit all the way because they've got a flag on their website that says donations are not tax deductible. So let's not give these guys money. For item four, moving on. I believe item four violates the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act, 11.125, that section, because it is written in, item four is written in an overgeneralized language, which forces public, the public to guess which, agen which agenda item it is about. Item four, in addition, this health commission, which item four is about, is considered, the Health Commission is considered a board under the Bagley Keene Open Meeting Act. From my understanding, this meeting should have been announced 10 days ago. Instead, this meeting for item four was uh, added in a sneaky attempt to deny the public access to information. That's how I feel. Now for my public comment, moving on to, the, to my last part. I attended the last city council meeting on 8-6. The meeting adjourned with a slide on YouTube. It was a blue slide simply stating the next meeting is scheduled for Tuesday, August 10th, 2021, 10 a.m. So this YouTube slide at the time reflected the calendar on clerk.lacity.org. My concern is on 8-7, the calendar was updated to reveal three meetings, including this one, which was scheduled prior to the original 8-10, 10 a.m. meeting. This behavior is in violation of Section 11.125 of the Bagley Q and Open Meeting Act. Please reschedule your vote today. Um, and after, just after 10 a.m. on 8-10, that's just so that we can all be informed and we can learn a little bit more about these topics. Thank you. Um, thank you for your uh, coming to the meeting this evening and for your opinions. Um, let me just state for the general public who are listening to this uh, throughout the city, uh, we, uh, we are uh, actually in total compliance 
uh, with uh, the Brown Act, and uh, there was proper notification uh, of the agenda that was uh, made available to the general public uh, last Friday. Um, this is a regularly scheduled meeting that was, in fact, uh, notified to the public in July 12th. Um, we're in total compliance uh, with all rules, regulations of both the City of Los Angeles ordinances as well as with um, California law. Um, so there's been misstatements there. In regards to um, um, our a later speaker, uh, the a prior uh, a member of the public is, is uh, uh, incorrect. It, it is a not-for-profit. Um, however, it's an organization um, that lobbies. And hence, because of uh, IRS tax laws, uh, if an organization lobbies more than 5%, uh, those uh, donations are not tax deductible. Uh, it is a not-for-profit by IRS code, um, and uh, the prior speaker was uh, incorrect uh, in uh, those assumptions. Um, having said that, um, I, is there anybody else in the uh, public uh, waiting rooms? There's no one left. Excellent. Thank you. Moving on to the next agenda item, it is with great pleasure um, that we invite Dr. Randall Kuhn, uh, who's a distinguished uh, associate professor um, at uh, UCLA uh, Fielding School of Public Health um, to speak on homelessness and um, health care. Dr. Kuhn, we're honored that you take uh, time from your busy schedule to present to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Mandel. Uh, great pronunciation of my last name, which is rare, so I appreciate that. Um, can everyone hear me okay and see the slides okay? Uh, okay. Um, hopefully things will be quiet on my end. I do have a child out there uh, watching TV, but uh, she seems pretty happy. So, Certainly the TV would be more interesting to her than this. Um, I really appreciate your having me here at this uh, pretty important time uh, in, um, in our homelessness history and crisis in Los Angeles. And I'm mindful of the fact that we've had many important times in our history in the past, and we've mostly, they have not for the large part turned out well. So I'm, of course, always hopeful uh, that we can uh, keep improving. And uh, the topic that I have for today is homelessness as a medical condition. And I'm not here to necessarily in any way argue that we must treat homelessness as a medical condition or to provide incontrovertible evidence that homelessness is a medical condition. I'll provide some arguments in support of why it may be helpful to think of it as a medical condition, what sort of the ways in which it acts like a medical condition, and then circle back to some of the implications, right? What really matters, because like, homelessness is many things, right? Homelessness is a product of poverty, of structural racism. Homelessness has many manifestations. But uh, thinking of homelessness as a medical condition can be simplifying for things like the response to COVID-19 uh, among homeless uh, among people experiencing homelessness. Um, and it can also just be, you know, it's sort of helpful, I think, to begin with this quote, which is from uh, my friend and colleague, Coley King, uh, who many of you may have seen. He's often the go-to person when the New York Times or the LA Times has a story about what's happening on the ground uh, with people experiencing homelessness. So, right, Coley leads the street medicine program or homelessness and health uh, program at Venice Family Clinic. Uh, and, you know, he, in talking to him, he just said, I, I think this is the simplest way to think about it, right? Diabetes cuts eight years off the average life expectancy. Homelessness takes more like 20 to 30 years, right? And so I could kind of just stop right there and let him have the last word. And, um, and I'll try to be efficient in just kind of adding to that basic point, right? And, and this is to keep in mind that many things like uh, diabetes, HIV, cancer are not necessarily just one thing, but we have many medical conditions that we can think of that are syndromes. And so to think of, like, homelessness is not one thing, it has many manifestations, but to think of it as a class of syndromes uh, can be helpful. And so I'll just go through, part of why I was contacted was this report 
uh, that I put together with three uh, wonderful grad students and postdocs, um, or two grad students and a postdoc, in our program on homelessness and health in LA. Uh, and so I just want to provide a little bit of what we, kind of we what we said in that report, right? Which is that if we right, homelessness is a risk factor for disease, and and it's a risk factor for a great many health conditions, and so. If we just sort of, you know, in scanning the evidence on um, what is the relative risk of different diseases for people experiencing homelessness versus not, we get relative risks along the lines of three times more likely to have hepatitis B, 10 times more likely to have HIV, 16 times more likely to have hepatitis C, which is one of the most treatable and costly conditions uh, out there. Uh, and Active tuberculosis, I mean, we can say hundreds to a thousand times. I mean, at a certain point, the math of relative risk becomes kind of absurd. But right? the point is, active TB hardly exists in the general population, and it exists in surprisingly high numbers among people experiencing homelessness. We can also look to chronic disease, though, and, and this is you know, one of the where the concerns around COVID-19 started, right, it, is that homeless people not only will experience higher levels of chronic disease and markers of chronic disease at the same age relative to the general population, but treatment for chronic conditions is often incredibly hard. So when I talk to Coley, you know, when I go on walkthroughs with Coley, especially like before the pandemic, it wasn't infectious disease that kept them up at night, and it wasn't like substance abuse, but there are, there are antidotes for, for opioids. There's monthly haldol to treat schizophrenia, a single dose for a month. But there's nothing that can treat MS or Parkinson's disease or Huntington's disease if you're on the streets because you need medicines that require refrigeration. Um, so again, it's really across the board. And so the way we sort of frame homelessness and, and chronic disease or homelessness and accelerated aging is that at the same age, say if, if a homeless person is 55, they will present with health conditions and surgical complications uh, more comparable to someone 10 to 15 years older than that. So a 55-year-old might present with the health conditions and risks of a 65 or 70-year-old. That matters because LA's homeless, over 65 homeless population is rising rapidly. So these are some forecasts that we did uh, back in 2017, looking at the trajectory of the over 65 homeless population, which has already uh, had already doubled from 2009 to 2017, and we forecast that it will more than double again by the year 2030. And right, the, the reason that is happening is largely a cohort effect, right? It's that people born in the late baby boom era, so those born 1955 to 1965, have historically faced higher levels of a number of risks relating to poverty, opioid use, premature mortality. Homelessness is part of that continuum. Right? It's, and it's simply that people in that cohort who have dominated home, the homeless population throughout the U.S. for decades are now simply reaching 65. And before they reached 65, there were 55, right? The many now, but the, the kind of most common ages in the homeless shelter system, right, or homeless population right now are people in their 50s, which means they're younger than the general population, but they're getting older. And if you add 10 to 15 years, for the, the weathering, for the negative consequences of living in homeless shelters or living on the streets, then this is a population dominated by 50 to 60 year olds who present more like 65 to 75 year olds. This shows up in the COVID-19 numbers. Um, again, I was part of a team that wrote a report that sort of raised the alarm around COVID-19, which was related both to concerns about possible transmission uh, because of, say, hygiene conditions uh, among people experiencing homelessness, especially in homeless shelters. Um, uh, but the bigger concern that we had was not about transmission. It was about vulnerability, right? It was that if you got COVID at the same age, right, you would be much more likely to die uh, or to experience complications or to be admitted to the ICU if you were homeless than if you were not homeless. And what's happened over the last year, you know, there have been a number of stories published about how, oh, L.A. dodged a bullet on COVID-19 and homelessness or something to that effect. That, and again, we want to be very clear about this. What the numbers suggest, as well as we can understand them, 
is that the rate at which homeless people died uh, was about comparable to the rest of the population, right? Which means we should celebrate, we're being told we should celebrate because this is the one disease, right, whereas most infectious diseases are three, ten, or a thousand times more likely to affect homeless people. This is one disease that wasn't. It was merely no more likely or no less likely. When you add the fact that homeless people are younger, what you find is that at the same age, right, again, something happened that prevented homeless people from getting COVID-19 and severe COVID-19, possibly relating to life outdoors and some protective effect of being outdoors, but more likely due to the fact that Project Moonkey protected not just homeless people, but 4,000 of the most vulnerable, high-risk older adults and people with risk factors in hotels for the entire duration of the high-risk period. But once you ignore all of that, when you just look at, okay, comparing the general population, 30 to 49, apples to apples, unhoused to general population, 50 to 64, 65 plus, what you see is at a similar age, homeless people were two to four times more likely to have died from COVID-19 than the general population, but then people of the same age, right? That is, even though exposure to the disease was not particularly high, people still were more likely to die. And again, we believe that is because of what life on the street does to your body. And then there's the even worse news, which I think many people on this commission will be familiar with, which was in spite of the fact that COVID-19 has only killed an additional, say, 200 homeless people uh, that we know of, possibly more that we haven't enumerated, over the last year and a half, in spite of that, a new pattern, uh, right, the, more t the real problem during COVID-19 has not been mortality due to COVID-19, it's been mortality due to everything else, right, which is that, so this uh, graph that was put up by Capital in Maine basically shows that for, Jan this compares January 2018-19-20, February 2018-19-20, we had pretty comparable numbers of deaths starting in March of 2020 we see this very pronounced spike, right? Which is that beginning in exactly the month that the pandemic began, the already, like already deaths on the streets among homeless people were growing about 10% a year. And on top of that additional 10% that we'd seen growth in every year, the number of homeless deaths in 2020 rose by about 30%. And that began, that extra part began basically in March. Um, and again, there are some, the LA County Department of Public Health issued a report basically attributing about half of these deaths to substance overdose, but about half of them are, are completely unexplained. Um, okay, so the basic point here is that homelessness is a risk factor, for, is, is a, a syndrome, right? Risk, risk factor for infectious disease, chronic disease, uh, and accidents and injuries and violence. Um, I want to turn briefly to applications of the medical approach. Then I want to also turn to, okay, why is homelessness bad for your health? And say kind of what we know about that. And also turn to the vaccination question, which was posed to me. So um, in terms of the applications of the medical pro right, approach, right, we already take this approach a lot of the time. So Project Linky, Project Homekey, the base is basically a recognition of the fact that homelessness is a health risk factor, right? That basically we think homelessness puts people in enough risk, excess risk, due simply to the fact that they are homeless, not to any other risk factors affecting them, that we believe that, that right, that it was understood city, county, state, federal level, that protection, putting people in hotels made sense as a way to protect them from that excess risk. Same logic when we think about how it was quite a battle, but eventually homeless people were uh, prioritized uh, for COVID-19 vaccines in uh, tier 1B, right? And so those, uh, uh, right, and of course, where we're gonna get to is the question of it, what's the real, if homelessness is a medical condition, what's the real cure? And we're gonna talk about housing and the implications of that. But uh, um, let me just kind of start with, with uh, why, does such excess health risk exist among people experiencing homelessness? And, and I'll just come right out and say, we don't know very much. And, and 
the email that I received kind of asking me to come speak, asked, you know, there were some questions that I'll have a hard time answering in terms of kind of recommendations for policies and solutions, because, right, in order to, aside from saying homelessness is bad, so people need to be housed, if we want to say what else can we do in the interim, or what else can we do in addition to housing, we would need a body of evidence on whether any, what the, what the conditions are that need to be treated and what the what solutions work but we don't really have too much of this right so what we can say is that much of excess health risk is related not to is not caused by homelessness but is related to the lifetime exposure to poverty under housing racism that precedes the entry into homelessness and there's simply right homelessness and poor health are both manifestations of the same set of conditions but beyond that, right, part of what we've been doing in some of our statistical models is trying to isolate, okay, how poor is the health of a homeless person upon entry into homelessness, and then how much worse is their health getting after, say, one, two, three years homeless. And what we can identify is there's a clear, so right, as much as the evidence can, can say, because it's very hard to collect data among people experiencing homelessness, and more importantly, no one takes the effort. It's, it's, it's quite possible. And what I'm going to talk about next is how you can do this work. But the commitment has not been there to, to do this kind of, kind of hard work to actually uh, follow people. And again, follow people with uh, humility and with uh, an, you know, a, a meaningful approach to ethics and justice and beneficence, right? Which is people, with, uh, people in a high-risk population often want to have their health issues and their trajectories studied. Um, and part of our approach to, part of the principle that we brought to collecting data, longitudinal data, where we actually follow homeless populations voluntarily, has been that, that many want their voices to be heard, and they certainly deserve to have their voices be heard. So we know that there is an emerging set of health risks that come after homelessness, and we can think about all the specific risks that those might be, right? So living on the streets in particular, we can think about environmental contamination, pollution, poor hygiene, uh, exposure to sexual risk networks, exposure to drug networks. But there are no studies that literally all the kind of gold standard cohort studies that we would think of don't uh, test whether exposure to a particular risk, say whether people living near the freeway are more likely to have a set of conditions than people not living near a freeway. Lack of access to health care is certainly going to matter quite a bit. We are certain that chronic homelessness adds additional risk. And that is, we have a definition of chronic homelessness in the sort of homelessness system. That is, if you're in the system more than a year and you have a health condition, then you're chronic, which confuses a lot of people. Because, like, really, I, I would normally think of this as just let's think about the time component. But even if you just think about the time component, it's not like after one year, you accumulate all the extra risks associated with chronic homelessness, and then it stops. In fact, our models are suggesting that each additional month, even when you get up to 36 months, there's still an association that each incremental month of homelessness is making your health worse and worse. And then unshelteredness adds to that, right, which is, again, we can't say specifically what it's doing, but we can hypothesize about all the ways that living, right, and, and again, we don't want to be too outsmart ourselves on this, right? Living outside is really dangerous. That's why most people prefer to live inside. Um, and, and, but it is important to just under, sometimes just to say, what are the specific things associated with this that are bad for, bad for health? And that's really hard to do. Um, so part of what we've been doing in the last few months, I've been part of a team, uh, at UCLA, USC, working with Ben Henwood in the School of Social Work there and with Aikido Labs, which is a digital data collection innovation firm. And we've been trying to collect a monthly longitudinal survey of people experiencing homelessness. And I'll just say, as yet, we're, we're still at the pilot stage. We have a sample of about 100 people uh, that we've been following for six months on their mobile phones. Um, we're not yet able to answer a lot of these questions. But we're just trying to get proof of concept on this type of approach. Basically, to say that you can and should ask people questions. And that if you did ask people questions, you could start to understand, okay, how much worse are things getting? Or if you put someone in housing, do they stay in housing? Do they recover? Or 
if you took a population living in an encampment and moved them suddenly overnight all out of an encampment and into a different location, where would they go? Where would they end up? And what would happen to them? And, and, and so that is at one level we could evaluate what are the consequences of a decision like that. On the other hand, you could also, in the meantime, using the same system, ask people questions along the way of what do you need? What is it that you're not getting? What is it? Why is it that you're here? And are there things that could be offered to you that would make it more enticing to move in? So, um, so we've been developing this basic data platform that's kind of regular and flexible, that is scalable. It's 100 people right now, but it could be many thousands. And it collects relatively high quality data, self-reported in the comfort of someone, you know, just answering questions on their mobile phones. As a pilot, we partnered with Venice Family Clinic and basically spent a lot of time just figuring out how do you get people that join up with a system like this? And how do you get the data, collect the questionnaire just to look comfortable? To people, and then how do you deliver incentives electronically? And incentives that people value, like not Amazon cards, because if you don't have an address, it's actually really hard to get a delivery from Amazon. So we've gotten pretty high response rates and continued engagement. We've collected monthly surveys on a bunch of things relating to COVID-19, access to care, substance abuse. Um, I'll show you the link to our visualization dashboard where you can see all of this. And then what I wanted to, one of the questions that was posed to me was about vaccination, so I also wanted to share that in the third monthly survey, which was sent out in February 2021, we were basically able to quickly say, hey, the vaccines have arrived, there's going to be some concern about vaccine uptake and also access and also hesitancy. Let's get some questions in there and see what we've got. And so pretty quickly what we were able to do is kind of raise the alarm. This was, so this was data that were collected in February. We presented these results to Department of Health Services and, uh, and posted them on the web in March. Um, and so we're able to get this information out here, right? That at the time, not very many people had been offered the vaccine yet. But among both those who were offered the vaccine or those who were just asked a hypothetical question of would you take the vaccine, we found that about 48% of people, and again, in this relatively small sample, that 48% were hesitant, expressed either they didn't want the COVID vaccine or they would prefer not to answer whether they wanted the COVID vaccine or not. Um, and, you know, we went beyond that and didn't just ask kind of who uh, was hesitant about, about the vaccine. We also looked at kind of what are the reasons. And I think this fits very, you know, part of what we found is that among people experiencing homelessness, it's sort of very similar concerns to what you see in a lot of highly vulnerable populations, right? There's a lot of fear of side effects. People want more information first. Some people are just truly against any vaccine. Some people are concerned about this new vaccine. Um, one of the things we noticed that I think is really important is that right, people who were more afraid of COVID-19, either because they had a risk factor or just because they expressed the fear, were much more likely to get the vaccine. Right? So people are assessing their health risks and responding to them accordingly, which is those who are more afraid are more likely to get the vaccine. But what we also see is that those people who protected themselves from COVID-19, um, so sorry, these are the sorry, these are the no's and these are the yeses. So these are the no's, these are the yeses. People who protected themselves from COVID-19 by doing things like wearing masks and washing their hands, the people who were more likely to protect themselves were more likely to be hesitant to the vaccine. And so this is a really important realization, I think, right? Which is these are not the people who are like I don't care about my health. I'm not thinking about my health. I'm not going to get the vaccine. These are people who are basically saying, I take care of myself. But, and, and part of what you hear when you talk to people on the ground is, well, I've been on the front lines of this thing for over a year. I've been wearing my mask. I haven't gotten COVID-19. This vaccine scares me. Why should I take the vaccine? And, and again, I think there are arguments, clearly arguments to counter that. But the logic is, is, is very pervasive. Um, the other thing we observed is that people who trust official sources of, of information about COVID-19 and mass media were less likely to be hesitant, but people who trusted personal sources of information or social media were more likely to be hesitant. And so you put all this together, and, you know, part of the story, one of the questions I was asked is what, what can be done about improving that, that, that vaccination rates. One thing I want to say is this is our most recent dashboard, and so this dashboard you can find I have the link at the end. It's homelessresearch.aquito.com. Um, these are the, right, that, those data were from February. 
Now we have six more months of data, and what we see is that vaccine hesitancy was down, going down, and then plateaued. Vaccine coverage was going up, but then plateaued. But then in July, as presumably as people got more concerned about the Delta variant, we do see hesitancy dropping for the first time in a while, and vaccine coverage rising for the first time in a while. And we, I guess we might expect that to continue during August. Again, possibly too little, too late, but uh, at least there's some progress. So. Part of the point would be there is progress, but then part of the point would be that we think that the story, right, if the story is people think that the vaccine is scary and they think that COVID is manageable and their trust, and they're especially likely to say that if they get their information from interpersonal sources, then peer-based interventions, especially now with the Delta variant, right, peer-based interventions that focus on stories of how a combination of Here's, I took the vaccine and I was fine and I didn't get COVID and I didn't have any other health consequences. And some stories about I didn't get the vaccine and these things happen. Delivered through a peer network can be potentially quite impactful and moments like now would be the time to deliver them. Okay, um, so that was, that's just a, a kind of a little aside on vaccine. And, and then again, I, I wanna get back to this larger question that was posed um, in the email that I received about what else can we do? Are there interventions that could reduce other health risks? Um, and, and, you know, the challenge of delivering even vaccination shows how hard a lot of this work is, right? What we know is that housing, put it, providing housing works. It's not perfect, right? There are lots of health risks, say, potentially higher risks of substance abuse at the moment that people enter housing, especially if they enter housing in an inappropriate model for their needs. But aside from housing, almost no interventions have been evaluated. And so it's very, very difficult to um, assess the benefit of many of these health interventions. And I wanna be clear that because we know housing works, we really want to assess the value of any intervention, not just on whether it can reduce disease risk, but on whether it will reduce disease risk and increase willingness to accept housing. Right, because anything, any kind of street medicine that you can offer could reduce disease risk, but probably not as much as just providing housing. The reason to do street medicine would be if you can reduce disease risk in the period when someone can't get housing because there is no housing or won't get housing, and you can do so in a way that engages people with the system and, and builds confidence towards going into housing, then that's the intervention that we really want to support. So there was also a question about changes in the housing first approach. I'm happy to wait for questions on this. Again, I think there's really no such thing as housing first in LA, right? We need housing, we need lots more housing, and we still need lots of other like we need lots of emergency shelter, lots of housing, and lots of things for people who are not going to get housed right away. Services are needed before, during, and after rehousing, and services are a magnet to get people in that, right? They're an opportunity to talk to people. It's not just that the services build consequences, confidence. It's that the services are, start a conversation and then you can talk about other services. And I'll just say that I think probably most people in the, who are focused on this issue would recognize that in a sense, LA, maybe, maybe this is that as well, that our assessment in our report, and you're welcome to dive into that, was that LA was, oh, over LA in practice, but particularly in reputation, was over reliant on one particular version of a housing first approach, which was a particular kind of project based permanent supported housing. Part of what we've also been doing is using the same survey model. So we have a grant from uh, Patients and Outcomes Research Institute, which is the Obamacare research uh, funding initiative, to basically look at are the health outcomes any different? for people who are in scattered site uh, housing versus uh, single site, like project, the kind of housing projects, right? And so, could we, it, right, and now there are a lot more vouchers for say, putting people in section eight housing. We don't know that much about whether the outcomes are any worse or poor, they may be better. So just to finish up, more housing and more resources are needed. Um, all, all housing options must be explored. Just to get back to, I think maybe I buried my lead. The big implication, I think, of treating health, homelessness, as a medical condition, right, is on the end of creative financing for housing solutions, right, which is 
even though we've spent a lot more money on homelessness in the last five years, it's still a drop in the bucket. And that money, it's not that, I don't know whether that money could come from taxpayers, it's that it probably doesn't need to come from taxpayers, right? What most, what is most needed are, is more liquidity, more money to help people get quick, so, like, some people just need a little bit of financial help to get back into housing or avoid homelessness in the first place. And again, legal reform on evictions and uh, eviction moratoriums and interventions can help a lot there as well. Um, but then even for the high-cost housing models, right, there is an enormous amount of money that's being left on the table um, with, uh, um, with Medi-Cal, right, that not just housing, but a lot of the moving costs, take management, a lot of these things could be, and again, we have a whole plan for housing, you know, we, we issued this plan to the county for housing, permanent housing for older, older homeless adults that lays out a lot of the, uh, honestly, a lot of this, I, I don't do kind of policy and finance, uh, so a number of my colleagues on that project are, are much more informed, but like the basic principle is there's a lot uh, that can, uh, there's a lot that the health system could be covering if we were focusing on this more as a health condition. Expanding access to street medicine certainly helps, though that's going to be hard when you're simultaneously enforcing an anti-camping ordinance, frankly. Um, we need to drastically amplify outreach. Right? That came through loud and clear in our report. Um, probably, again, this is just my estimate, is that we probably need to expand outreach by a factor of 10. You can't hire 10 times as many outreach workers as you have now which means you have to rely, you may need twice as many outreach workers, but what you really need to do is amplify the reach of outreach workers by using more peer networks, using more, uh, ampl tapping into the expertise and leadership and skills of people who were recently homeless themselves, uh, and of course using mobile phones to bridge the digital divide, let people, like those who can self-assess, self-triage, and self-enrolling services should be empowered to do so, right? And that in doing so, the more we can rely on technology, right? This is not technology to replace case managers. It's technology to do the easy thing so that case managers can focus on what they do best. And of course, the last bit is to follow people. So it will, to ask people what they need and then to follow the same people to see what they got and whether those things worked. And so I'll just end with a link to our data site, which has lots of cool visualizations that you can check out and more coming. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Kuhn, if you could just go back to the, the wide screen so that we don't, um, we can all see each other if we want to. Yeah. Happy to thank, thank you for your um, superb uh, overview and uh, recommendations. Uh, we truly appreciate you coming out and, and talking to us. Um, uh, I'll, I'll take the uh, prerogative of the chair and uh, ask you a few, few uh, I think, um, relatively direct questions. Um, one is, clearly COVID has an impact on, on uh, all of us, our lives day to day. Um, have you seen an improvement in the homeless problem since COVID began? or uh, alternatively a, a worsening uh, of the numbers of people who are homeless, as well as the corollary to that is um, their general health? Um, in terms of the numbers, we don't know, right? So I'm part of the team that does the, the homeless count. And it was, of course, was canceled for 2021. Um, the few, we've had a few neighborhoods that have done street counts. And those have tended to suggest that, so Hollywood had a fairly, a somewhat well-publicized street count that suggested lower numbers. Um, we're doing a count in Skid Row, hopefully, uh, um, if everything goes according to plan in the next couple of weeks. Um, and so that will provide a little bit of, a little bit more evidence. But frankly, we don't know, right? There's, there's nothing in any of these street counts that suggests a massive increase in numbers which I think is unsurprising given that the eviction moratoriums have sort of had the effect, the, the desired effect, and Project Roomkey, right? We know that Project Roomkey literally brought 4,000 people into hotels. Now, a number of them have um, ended up in different places, and there's been all kinds of challenges along the way. But we also, you know, a number of permanent supportive housing projects also came online. So in a way, just as 
you know, going into the pandemic, the count had gone up 10%. And I never felt that we should have viewed that as our failure. Um, like it wasn't like we caused the number to go up 10%. That I suspect that the number is potentially lower, but that doesn't mean that we've really accomplished much of anything, uh, especially when you think about the, the coming wave. In terms of health outcomes, in terms of health outcomes, I think we know uh, even less. I really don't write because the count, the demographic survey and the count is really what we depend on. You know, we know that more people have died, um, which suggests that it's not, it can't be, it, it, in a sense, it can't be better. It can be better because the average duration, but the, the, that because people are, are not getting out faster than they come in, and, and right, a lot of the lack of progress is among people who are already chronic, right? That we believe, I believe that the average, again, this is hard to calculate still, but that just, a person on the street this year would have been there longer than last year, which would undoubtedly mean they have worse health as well. But, but really, we don't know anything. So, so we know that you and your team um, have consulted with the L.A. County Department of Public Health. Um, we were just wondering um, if you have connections and or the ability to reach out to city leadership, um, either city council members who are on the homeless uh, com uh, com commission uh, slash committee um, or the mayor's office, um, and, and if so, are they responsive um, to your advice, and your suggestion? Um, ooh, delicate question. Uh, it, you know, in general, so you know, we we talk to often. You know, we we try to be pushy, right? And we're we try to be very, you know, kind of stick to the data and and speak, you know, talk policy when we're spoken to. So, you know, for instance, we talked to the mayor's team when it came to, you know, kind of estimating the right number of hotels, hotel rooms for Project Room Key, but haven't been, in, haven't been in communication since then. We've talked to Council Member Bonin's office a little bit about some mobile phone pilots, but, but for the most part, we, and we've talked to county a little bit more, but we've not had much contact with city um, at, at present. Wonderful. And then the other one is, is, and I know this is, you know, difficult to, to do, and you answered it a little bit in, in your talk, uh, which is the, you know, the way to improve health of homeless people to get them off the streets and get them housing. Um, um, do you have any suggestions, or uh, being an expert who's analyzed this from a scientific point of view, do you have ideas um, or suggestions that have not been tried by the city uh, in order to get unhoused people um, uh, temporary or permanent housing that could then improve their health and, and, and play catch up. Is this as a supply question or a demand question or both? Uh, both. I mean, the reality is, you know, yeah. uh, we're, we're, we're looking for uh, suggestions that uh, have not been uh, uh, properly analyzed yet and then potentially should be analyzed. Right. You know, and, and, and it's hard to know. So on the demand, I mean, we always say, you know, I, I come out of most of my work has been in global health, you know, and in global health, it's always a matter of, you know, we say we need to articulate supply to demand or demand to supply, right? It's not just supply. You can't, right? you can't create, you can't create demand without supply. Um, um, and if you create supply and there's no demand, nothing will happen. So it's right a matter of getting kind of stimulating uh you know, kind of squeeze, you, the supply is the bigger problem, right? And, and I don't know that I have too many, I think the point is we need to do everything we can, right? So hotels, if we think about this as a mathematical problem, and, and you know, I think the, the next speaker may have some thoughts on sort of how you get to the numbers, right? We know that safe camping potentially offers some numbers, that safe parking would offer some numbers that hotels would offer some numbers and that there are ways to squeeze some action out of, say, providing subsidies to, you know, to say, you know, your relatives might be more likely to take you in if you had a $500 subsidy coming with you or something like that. But these are all conjectures that need to be evaluated. They're all ideas. They're all good ideas. I mean, you know, they're not my ideas, so I'll, I'll say they're good. But they, but they haven't been evaluated. and. And I'm not sure that any of them add up to 
the solution, right? And so ultimately, the bigger picture then is increase liquidity dramatically, right? get more money into, um, get more get more money into people's hands through public benefits, through Medi-Cal, so that the market can start to open up. And then obviously, then you have to think about how supply can increase, right? Can you convert units that already exist or can you quickly build new units? Um, and so, go ahead. I was just going to say that, 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 that um, your hypothesis is that homelessness is a health problem. Um, which, which I think most of us in the commission would, would agree with you. Um, but there's be savings um, by public health. I mean, perfect example, um, every single time the paramedics go out to pick up a homeless person and, and transport them, um, it costs the city of Los Angeles $1,980. And, and, and clearly, um, if we could, instead of you know, doing that, picking them up and transporting them to a hospital, um, if that individual is doing that 10 times a year, we can pay rent for them for the same amount of money and, and lower their health care costs. I mean, that's... Sure. And that's in our older homeless adult plan. You know, what we generally see is that the, low, the people who can be housed at low cost tend not to save that much money, right, because they're not using the system, the health system, that much. So, but the people who are most expensive yield, right, who... who who it costs them, right? So part of the problem here is that because we've let this challenge go for such a long time, compared to other cities, we have an unusually large number of people who are chronically homeless and high need, right? This is part of what came up with Project Roomkey, where there was this idea that, oh, we could just open a bunch of hotels and rehire the hotel staff, and they could manage Project Roomkey hotels. But the reality was most of the people who were being recruited to go into Project Monkey, especially the highly vulnerable ones, were high need, right? You needed costly services. Uh, the flip side of that, though, is they cost a lot, but they save a lot. Now, the real key is the people who, if the people who are spending the money are different from the people who are saving the money, then you're never going to solve it, right? So if, if we spend more money to house people and thereby save Medicare, or you know, Medi Medicaid, or Medicaid contractors money, then they're like, thank you. Um, so it really, we need to bring the, 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 the cost together in that way. Excellent points. Um, Commissioner Shannon, you have a couple questions. I do. So thank you so much for, for coming tonight. Um, I have a, I've worked with our unhoused community since 2005 and um, in the drafter of SB 1380, which is the state's housing first model. And I have a, a number of questions for you on a housing first model, but also on a few other things um, that were part of your presentation. So I want to know, because it feels like with the recent ordinance that passed um, and the handling of Echo Park Lake and a number of other places, that um, while it felt like the city of LA and the county, I would say um, even more so, was embracing this housing first model, which for me was about addressing first our chronic homeless population and then second that, you know, next tier um, in terms of like health vulnerabilities. Um, and so I'm wondering, what did you think about the handling of Echo Park Lake? Because I do know that one of the criticisms was that if you're not going by the coordinated entry system or the VSPDAT score so that you're looking at a vulnerability index, that just having people based on geography as opposed to being chronically homeless, um, someone who is costing, uh, where it's costing the city and the county and the state and federal government more money to have them out there and who are probably more in danger of dying on the street. Um, do you, you know, just in your research or just anecdotally, um, do you think it's, it's better to have this approach where we're housing people who are chronically homeless first um, as opposed to just going by geography, like, oh, my God, they're in the parks or near the library kind of thing. Right. And this, I, I mean, that's very tough, right? Um, and, you know, I think the first thing to say is the logic of just going by risk, the problem with that, I, I don't know if there's a problem, right? the, the, the problem with it in L.A. has been that we 
you can't, you, you, there are so many high risk people and so few resources that we never got to the medium risk people and they became high risk <laughs> and the low risk people became medium risk and are now in danger of becoming high risk. And, and, right, and, and so it's kind of a mountain that keeps getting bigger and bigger. And, right, and so going by geography, in a sense, can't be the solution to that problem, right? And, and, and probably most of the people would agree. Uh, on the com commission, I'm guessing, would agree that there's no logic to moving place by place. Um, there's no particular logic, aside from the, no and, right? And, and uh, again, this is not my, gentrification and, and NIMBYism are not my area of expertise, but I think it's safe to assume that a neighborhood, by, a place by place approach will lead to the loudest and most powerful places getting this first. Right. We, we all know that. Um, and, and so I choose, you know, I'm sort of choosing to approach this with there are, there's no particular good reason to do this, or at least it's not, that that's not the reason why this bill passed, right, this, law, this ordinance passed. That being said, and I, and I don't agree with the ordinance at all, um, but that being said, there are ways in which this ordinance could be an interesting test of our ability to do the things that we say we want to do, right, which is if this is, you know, if, if, if this is going to go to certain areas first, let's try it out. And many of those are areas where, say, the community is more engaged on this issue or there are more resources to be put to bear or if there's a council member who's more, or, or neighborhood council who's more interested in doing this, then let's see if we can do it right. Um, okay. and, and, and let's, right, let's seriously ask people what they need, seriously test whether people are, um, are getting, the emergency housing that they need or the permanent housing that they need. And then, and of course, seriously check that enforcement of the ordinance is not violating rights. Right. Um, thank you for that. So we only have about, we only have shelter and interim housing combined for about 35% of our unhoused population in the city, which is a little over 40,000 people. Um, so, Typically what I find is that when there's a vacancy in a shelter, it's because someone has left. It's not necessarily because someone has moved to housing, um, which is being created at a very slow pace, right, and is also extremely expensive. Um, so do you, I'm just wondering, when you are looking at housing as a way to um, limit to some extent some of these health risks, do you take into account whether someone is going into a congregate shelter or into permanent housing or into something that, and what I would say is interim housing would be like the pallet shelters or the motels where at some point a motel owner, if it's not owned by the city, could pull out of that program and leave people kind of scrambling. Um, or, right, so, so do you, and in shelters, you know, a lot of my clients have been kicked out of shelters for the most ridiculous reasons, like too many hangers at their bed or something like that. So do you separate that out in terms of congregate shelter, interim shelter that's non-congregate and permanent housing in terms of looking at like retention rates, looking at health? Um, and if not, like are you, do you, are you interested in doing that kind of research? I mean, right now we don't do much of anything um, because HMIS data are not suitable to the purpose you describe. And that, that's part of why, you know, our emphasis is on scaling up uh, longitudinal data systems. And, and again, we, we think surveys are cool, but we actually think these should be embedded in the ecosystem, right? That HMIS is a 20th century creation at best. And I was, you know, having left the homelessness space for a number of years and come back in, I was kind of stunned to see that HMIS much as it looked in the 90s and early aughts, was still being used. And, and that's before we get to something like the to DAP, which is, you know, not suitable for any purpose uh, in any century. Um, so, and that, so that leaves us with a big mountain to climb. On the other hand, kind of, we could just, 
not, we shouldn't ever think about start kind of starting from scratch and blowing something up, especially in terms of systems. But, but certainly if there were ever, you know, we, the idea should be to follow, to, to be able to follow people uh, to see how their, what their outcomes are and do so as part of kind of a, a part of a voluntary system, a service ecosystem, right? An app, and again, apps are rightly criticized, but an app that is grounded, that is, so my colleagues at Aikido are working with work with topics on piloting an app that is basically based on principles of case management and community engagement. And if you can have an app like that, that is generating data on whether people are recovering, what their service needs are, and so on, that you can get to something much more, um, you know, much more focused on the person. HMIF is not focused on the person, it's focused on the episodic encounter, which means we know what service a person received because that's for accounting purposes. We need to know what was the duration in which they received emergency shelter or interim housing. But we do not know what happened to them. We don't know why they left. The system doesn't care why they left. And if they went into permanent housing, that's not part of the system. So that's not even recorded. And so the evaluations of Measure H have been emphatically clear that the data do not exist to measure whether people are recovering. Right. Whether people are staying housed, much less whether they're recovering. Got it. Um, and then have you done any research on the Utah model, which is we kind of based SB 1380 on that. Um, and they were the first state and maybe the only state at this point to reach a functional zero. Um, and that was back, I think, in 2015, 2014, um, basically using the housing first model, um, no enforcement. Um, it was all voluntary um, going into housing. Um, well, they had a really interesting approach in terms of changing how the nonprofit saw this. Um, but I'm just wondering if you've done any research, because for me, given the fact that they were the only state to reach a functional zero on chronic homelessness, um, it, also showed, it also showed what the retention rate was um, in terms of housing, um, you know, how people stayed in the program as opposed to leaving. Um, they didn't have to be housing ready, you know, so it was a full housing first model. So I'm just wondering if you've done any research on Utah. I haven't firsthand. I mean, I've looked at what they, you know, what they've done, and obviously, the, you know, there are going to be questions about how you scale Utah to LA. But that's always, you know, that's people, haters are going to hate, right? But there's, there's always, it's always going to be easy to say, well, we can't do that here. Uh, certainly, our population is more complex in terms of needs and more diverse, and we've we've left it so long that there are more people with higher needs. But the basic logic is clear: that if you know if you know who's in the system, then you know it. Then you know that functional zero is not something you can infer, right? That in Utah they did. It was comforting to see that their pit counts were going down, right? We're leveling off, and so in that sense, it's nice to see from a pit count that you have indeed achieved functional zero. But if you're having to rely on a pit count to know that then you're in trouble, right? What you really need to know is within the system itself, right, that we have the ability to know who our clients are, right? That is that if, our, if, if your client is sent out of shelter, right, for whatever reason, and again, case managers do this, right? They, that case managers will say to the board and care, if you're going to throw this person out, let me know and give me 48 hours, and I will do something for that. But that is not a system. That is, you know, a saint. But the system, right, is a system that, that, no, that has a button that you can push to say, well, first of all, a system is one that gives incentives to board and cares not to dump people on the streets, right? But beyond that, it is a system that asks board and cares what they need to keep people. And if they really can't keep a person, then there's a button they can push that would put them in another resource. And, and it would be a system that matches inventory to need and has inventory. Sorry, now I'm not going to get depressed. Um, um, one of the recommendations of this um, commission, the health commission, has been to um, expand the housing for health department for the county. I'm sure you're probably familiar with them, um, which I see is kind of the only real model for housing first anywhere in LA. 
Um, and then I'm wondering if you have worked with Housing for Health within the within the county. Um, and, you know, some of, they've done some pretty innovative stuff, in, including master leasing. Um, but, yeah, I'm just wondering if you have worked with them. Yeah, we, I mean, we, you know, we see everybody and, you know, we, we uh, work with them on the back, you know, we share the vaccination results with them. We kept in close contact with them during COVID around, like, shelter identification and, and uh, hotels and, um, and of course, we've been trying to work with them to enroll people in this study, the Permanent Supportive Housing Fixed versus Scattered Site um, Study. Uh, and, and right, they're able to create volume. Um, but it's sort of, this is a model where you can create more. It's not quite whole person care, right? Because whole person care is an amazing model as well, and they do incredible work. But they're able to serve, say, you know, a thousand. And Housing for Health can serve a much larger number than 1,000. It can't serve 60,000, right? So you still have to think about what, what are we going to do about inflow and what are we going to do about, um, about self-triage, not just self-triage. It's how do, you get, how do you get people engaged with systems that are not so, uh, so resource intensive? If, and, how do you get them engaged with a, low, a non resource intensive system? And then how do you graduate? Right? How do you apply this progressive engagement model? And essentially, right, the real challenge is when Housing for Health sees them, it's generally, it's not that it's too late, right? It's never too late, but it's, it's late. And so how you, get, how you get ahead of that curve is the real, the real challenge. Um, and, and that is not just that there's not enough time to reach people because you're focused on these the most challenging cases, is that a lot of people don't want to be rich, right? We know that HMIS doesn't cover a large share of the homeless population. Um, and, and they may be served by the, uh, you know, they may be served by uh, Housing for Health or by DMH, but, but really a large number of people are not being served at all. And, and some of them, that's because they don't want to be served, but that's then the point is you've got to just keep with, keep, keep with them. Right. And then my last question, actually I have two questions, if that's okay. Um, I was wondering, in, in terms of vaccine availability versus access, um, so I have a lot of clients who are on Skid Row. There were, was a lot of availability to vaccines there. Um, I'm sure in Venice as well, where there's a high concentration of people who are unhoused. Um, but how do you measure the access to the vaccine for people who are you know, miles away from services, um, living under a bridge. Right. And in that, you know, be, because we have to keep the questionnaire short um, and because we wanted to get something out quickly, we didn't do as intensive of an access model. And that was, that's tricky because, right, we, we know there are a lot of people who face that situation. I think ultimately what it came down to us is for, for us was because this sample are people who are engaged with Venice Family Clinic, we, right, again, they may not, be, may not be heavily engaged. It was just patients who had ever, you know, ever been coded as homeless in a Venice Family Clinic electronic health record and had a phone number. And so because in that, it was that particular sample, it didn't seem like access would be the primary consideration over time. And I think that shows in that, you know, if you, again, if you go back to the graphs we showed, that hesitancy is pretty much uh, vaccination is 100% minus the percent vaccinated is the percent hesitant. There kind of is no in between because, because access is possible, right? Because it is possible to reduce barriers to access. Now, for a non-clinic engaged population for a population in say uh, Antelope Valley or Conejo Valley or you know parts of San Fernando Valley that could be quite a bit more challenging. And for Skid Row, again, Skid Row is a different question, right? It's sort of access is clearly the services are available, but that doesn't mean people are, are they they may be completely fine with the vaccine, but they're not you know they're not willing to work with service providers. So I think most you know. Most people are engaged. And then in terms of um, the solutions here for housing, 
um, you know, we're, we're constantly in this state of trying to build permanent supportive housing, which seems to take forever and cost $500,000 a unit in some cases. Um, there are other models like prefab modular housing, like the Vignus property that went up that was about 220000 a unit. Um, there's adaptive reuse, which you sort of touched on a little bit, which is remodeling, um, you know, or even using these motels or, or other buildings. But there's also this, like, incredible, um, there, there's a large amount of vacant units. And, in fact, the last thing that I heard was that there were enough vacant units in the Skid Row area to house almost everyone on Skid Row. Okay, including one building that we know of that has 700 vacant units in the middle of Skid Row. So I'm wondering, is that something that you've looked at as well? Because sometimes when we talk about housing, we tend to focus on housing production as opposed to looking at, um, you know, what our inventory is, right, as a city, and then making, you know, decisions based on that inventory. Right. <laughs> You know, in putting together the older adult permanent housing plan, which had a target population of about 15,000, we did not consider inventory because the principle was that there are 15,000 units somewhere. That right that for any pilot, we were calling this a pilot, for even a large pilot, you could extract the units you needed. You kind of squeeze the, squeeze the lemon, right? And, and even 60,000 is not a large percentage of the county's population at any right at any given moment. And so it is even possible through a combination of all these things, right? That doesn't mean there isn't an inventory problem. Right? The, the inventory problem though is as much on the market housing side where people are getting evicted as on the rehousing side. So I don't want to pretend inventory would help, but and again I'm not an expert on this, but it doesn't seem to make sense to pay five hundred thousand dollars for that if you can pay less. And, and, and right, I do think this is potentially an advantage. Again, I don't think the neighborhood, I don't think this is at all why the neighborhood by neighborhood vote by vote approach is being applied. But there is an advantage of going neighborhood by neighborhood, which is you could have, you, right, in the absence of a computer system that matches inventory to need at the county level, in a, the context of a single neighborhood, there are, you can imagine what the, who, where the inventory is and, and match them to the people in a way that you can't at the county level. And so if maybe that buys us time. Um, it, you know, so these are, not, these are not great answers, right? Because I, I do think inventory would help a ton. But, but in some ways, it, you know, I think there is, if you could, if you could, make the system more productive at actually having people in the inventory that we have and helping them stay in the inventory that we have and bringing more money online, then I suspect the market, you, you might have opportunities to rethink the market's role here um, and, and come up with sub $500,000 solutions. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you for that um, excellent uh, discussion. Uh, are there other commissioners that have questions? If so, please raise your electronic hand or turn on your picture and jump up and down so I can see you. Um, just following up a little tiny bit is in, in your discussion, um, boarding care um, are individuals for the most part who um, are at very high risk of both illness and homelessness. Um, and unfortunately, the federal government and state pays so little that if you pencil out the costs of um, existing in L.A. City, um, both rent, taxes, um, and food costs, um, they're all losing um, uh, money. And in fact, there's less board and care uh, beds today than there was two years ago, three years ago, even before the COVID uh, phenomenon. Um, so unless we increase both state and federal funding for boarding care reimbursement, um, there's never going to be the ability to uh, uh, prevent that slide from getting worse. But uh, that's not really a question. It's more of a you know, uh, uh, kind of uh, 
uh, grandstanding on my on my part, but but it clearly that's a, it's it's only going to get worse unless we do something about that. And I think one of the problems we've had in in, in Los Angeles, um, and I think our next speaker is going to talk about this a little time, but is you know we've had this problem for 15 or more years, uh, and we're still stuck in neutral. The problem's getting worse, not better, uh, and we haven't really come up with um, uh, appropriate ways of, of really addressing it. And, and the healthcare of these individuals is getting worse. We've learned a lot the last year. I mean, I, I do think there, you know, I do think in that sense, COVID-19 has shined a light on the problem. It's opened people's minds to new solutions. There's been cooperation that you never would have seen before. And people have the idea that we could cooperate more in their heads, but that doesn't make it easy to do. And so it could be really disappointing or we could get this right. Great. Thank you. Well, we're, we're honored that you come to speak to us. Uh, uh, you're wonderful. Thank you uh, for enlightening us. Uh, uh, we uh, hopefully will work with you uh, going forward in the future. Um, the data you have, in, the research that you're doing is, is de definitely needed uh, by this commission as well as the entire uh, leadership of the City of Los Angeles, and we thank you for what you do uh, all day long. You're welcome to stay on uh, for the, uh, the next presentation uh, or the whole entire uh, commission meeting if you'd like. Um, probably the next uh, speaker probably will address issues that you, you do have an interest in. Uh, the rest of our business is probably quite boring to you, and having a family, you should uh, feel comfortable that we will not take it personal if you leave. Uh, but moving on to the next agenda item, seeing no other questions, um, it, it's my pleasure to um, introduce um, um, Craig. I'm definitely going to screw up your name. Uh, uh, Craig uh, Grewe. Uh, Grewe? Grewe. Gravy. Gravy. Close enough. <laughs> Gravy or no? Gravy with the V. Oh, V with V. Okay, great. Gravy. I apologize. Uh, Kuhn was so much easier. Uh, <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, who um, in, in his day job is a senior marketing uh, um, in, in logistics uh, expert uh, on trends uh, in marketing, but uh, as a volunteer has created an, an amazing organization, Rising Together, uh, which has um, released this week a roadmap um, to correcting the homeless problem within uh, 18 months. Uh, we're honored also that you would take time from your extremely busy schedule um, and thrilled uh, that you come present to us. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Mandel, and, and uh, thank you to uh, the prior presenter, Dr. Kuhn, uh, on such an incredibly informative presentation and, and to this commission for having us. Um, uh, just a precursor as we begin the presentation, uh, Rise Together is a, a 501c4 nonprofit that is focused on public education. Our fundamental premise is that the vast majority of people in this city don't believe that change is possible and leading into the future of this city, we want more than 50% of the people showing up to the ballot box to believe that not only is change possible, uh, but that it is the only way forward. To that extent, in order to help people believe that change is possible, one of the things that we're doing is a comprehensive outreach campaign to reach and educate the public through every manner, from direct mail, email, digital, social, and in directly relevant to what present I'm presenting this evening, um, in condensing the solutions that are already out there in ways that are digestible to the public. Uh, the idea is not that we are here to replicate the wheel by any stretch of the imagination, but that we are here to help interpret and decipher what's out here and put together strategies that allow us to share with the public that the solutions to our problems exist. The question is not, what to do but, uh, or how to do it, but who will do it and how we move forward to be value-add to that conversation. Our goal, in this case, uh, the, this commission is receiving a, a sneak preview, so to speak, of what we'll put out as a public roadmap this Wednesday, um, having condensed thousands of pages of reports and materials and talked to dozens of organizations across the, the city and the county, everyone from frontline workers um, to visits, uh, to with the homeless um, and the and the unhoused, uh, with those who are housing insecure, uh, with caseworkers, with research institutions, with advocates, 
our goal is to condense all of that into something that is digestible for the public. This doesn't mean that our plan should govern. It doesn't mean that our plan is final. What it means is that it's a roadmap, our roadmap of condensing all of this in a way for us to begin the conversation and move, as Dr. Mandel uh, referenced, to move out of neutral and to move forward as a city so that we can see real progress. That end, the top lines of our goal are to move Los Angeles to functional zero homelessness, uh, no chronic long-term homelessness. Uh, our targets and timeline are 50% housed in under nine months, 90% in under 18 months with uh, functional zero homelessness by 2024. Uh, this involves actually a reduction in current planned city expenditures and allocations at the very highest levels when we're talking in big round numbers um, from $8.35 to $4.18 billion, which is in line with our organization's representation that the question is not uh, how much money we have, but how we spend it to its most effective means, along with a comprehensive pre uh, prevention program around to prevent new homelessness established in under eight weeks and regulation and preservation of public spaces in the first four weeks. These are all built on pillars of services for addiction, mental health, uh, employment, more housing for immediate incident reduction. Our goal is not just, as we say, as, as is the term housing first, but it is all of it together in one interlocking equation. Education for growth and opportunity, prevention of new homelessness, and a transition to independence. We start that with our initial steps, looking at leadership to allow us to move forward. We don't believe that the solution is a gigantic new bureaucracy across the city. It's not the bureaucracy that's solving the problem. Uh, and we also believe that an amicable settlement to this lawsuit with the LA Alliance can actually help move the city and the county forward um, with a solution that is embraced by the courts and by the public and by leadership that is going to focus on transparency. To the extent that the city can't bring the county forward, we often hear and have heard in dozens of interviews about the city and county fighting and one needing to move forward without the other. The reality is, yes, they both need to move forward together. But to the extent that the county is unwilling to participate, our advocacy is for the city to move forward and then seek legal remedies to force the county's participation or reimbursement um, as a leverage tool towards cooperation rather, rather than waiting around. Data is critical to what we do. It is accepted across this country, in particular by so many nonprofits, that you can't solve a problem that you don't know. Community Solutions, one of the foremost advocates and nonprofits that we pull some of our data from, has been very clear about this, that there are mapping programs to allow us to know who's homeless, where they are, and what their needs are, so that when caseworkers reach them, that there is a case file and there is a real-time data mapping exercise. This is not only legal, but it's necessary to be able to understand who is where and needs what help and at what category of help. That requires resourcing and accountability in resourcing. We want to require uh, nonprofit organizations to participate in city-funded forensic accounting and public transparency requirements so that the public is aware of where taxpayer dollars are going. Compensation based on success rates, not overnight registrations. And immediate clawbacks on any PSH funds where a project hasn't broken ground in a temporary hold on project as we seek to focus on immediate and intermediate housing before we move into forever housing, permanent supportive housing in that vein, given its long lead time. That's matched against regulation, disincentives to stay on the street, as well as support. And this is where it becomes most essential and where the longest portion of our program is, is the support for everyone to become housed and healthy. Within eight weeks, we want to establish 20,000 shelter-based beds with semi-private rooms. Within residential locations, these would not be mass sited, but at no more than 40 per, per site with services, but then there would be scalable locations in non-residential areas with more intensive services requirements. Again, this is based on categorizing the level of need from an individual as to how much service they need. This would include a shutdown of the bridge home sites and a guarantee of no mass shelters in residential areas. Uh, it would be distributed citywide in city controlled land we, uh, as identified by both the city controller's office and in so many reports and independent authorities, um, including the Pacific uh, Urbanism Center and others. 
And looking at our research and collaboration with existing groups, the maximum infrastructure cost of this looks to be $10,000 per person for up to one year at $200 million per year. But it's not just immediate housing and shelter-based needs. It's also the fact that the city doesn't have an easy-to-use way to stay housed. If you are about to become unhoused, if you're about to lose your home, we're advocating for the creation of a 24-7, easy-to-use hotline that has a guarantee of 24-hour response with real financial immediate assistance and a six-month casework guarantee so that if you are a single mother of two who had to choose between uh, a car repair and your rent and you needed to keep your job so you kept your car, and now you're faced at the end of the month with that crucial decision of where the rent money is going to come from, that you can call and receive immediate help so that we can meet your needs, that if you are housed today, you are housed tomorrow, and then you work with a caseworker to stay housed over the coming weeks and months so that we're preventing new people from becoming homeless, from, in, from experiencing homelessness. That's critical. We don't go from ten or 20000 to 70000 unless new people are becoming homeless in a comprehensive solution that is, again, easy to use and simple to access. You know, the city had millions of dollars go unused in rental assistance because of the complexity necessary to engage in that program. We're advocating for something much, much simpler. As we move forward, we move into intermediate solutions. With initial stand-up operation as soon as six months, with total volume, or excuse me, six weeks, with total volume within six months. There are more than three dozen in-market and viable options sourced by a nonprofit housing innovation collaborative. Again, this is in line with our policy of not reinventing the wheel, not coming up with our own home design or anything that we have a vested stake in, but rather sourcing what's already proven to exist out there, what's been used in other municipalities around the world and around the country and in California. That includes 13,000 emergency shelters, 10,000 uh, tiny homes, as they're colloquially called, uh, 3,000 uh, high needs um, individual housed in a retrofit of 1,200 State Street with 24-7 around-the-clock support for those most in need. And that moves to, within nine months, 12,000 more in collaborative housing, using models already before the city for approval. And within one year, moving 90% of all individuals into shelter beds and then out of those shelter beds into intermediate housing, uh, both FEMA, tiny homes, collaborative housing, and additional, resource, additional emergency housing sourced via solutions demonstrated in the Housing Innovation Collaborative. When we look at these units and the costs, we see that the, the costs as provided by those housing providers is far less than what the city is currently paying. Holding a cap on those infrastructure costs allows us to then divert resources towards support and services that matches with housing. And when these numbers are not only from independent sources on the ground in other cities, including the 14 cities that have moved to functional zero homelessness in the U.S., working with community solutions and, and other municipalities throughout the country, but they, those numbers just don't seem to hold up here. So establishing hard caps and looking at transparently where that money is going, and then beginning the transition to long-term housing for those who are ready for it. This plan allows us, by placing a temporary hold on PSH construction and clawing back those funds, to evaluate who really needs permanent supportive housing, because every homeless individual doesn't. But rather, the vast majority of them, as explained to us by caseworkers and nonprofits on the ground, again, our policy is to take what's out there we're not bringing anything new to the table in terms of new research. What we're doing is coalescing the complex maze of research that's out there from nonprofits, individuals, frontline workers, and entities into something digestible for the public, for everyone to react off of, but moving folks into then permanent supportive housing where needed, and then within 18 months, having a permanent real-time database of any homeless individuals as well as matching, as Dr. Kuhn had mentioned, having a real-time database that matches individuals to housing options, including capacity at every site and a digital booking system. Uh, construction of 3,000 additional mental health beds and units distributed throughout the city and 500, 500 substance use disorder residential beds, and a clear map of exactly how much forever housing is needed. We're not advocating that we move away from permanent supportive housing forever. 
well, what we're advocating is that we place it on hold until we establish exactly how much is needed so that with these long lead times, we can establish what we're building and where, where we haven't broken ground already, and doing so with a cap on construction costs. If the private sector using union labor can build at less than half of what the city is doing, then we should be able to do so as well. And this involves also establishing permanent intermediate units for any new homeless individuals, along with permanent education programs that are resourced, including job assistance, skills training, and incentives against recidivism, compensating and bonusing entities working with the city based on their long-term and permanent success rate, not their short-term overnight, often in uh, double-counted or, or repetitive or irrelevant counts of, of one night versus permanently helping those who are most in need. Our goal, then, is to take all of this and reallocate existing funds into a proposed new budget of $5.185 billion over three years a nearly 50% cost reduction from current planned expenditures is mapped out to us by different city and, and nonprofit and county officials. And then we've broken down here the budgeting by phase, uh, but all of this is included in the other portions that are earlier in the report. We made uh, uh, some minor updates in numbers here, uh, but ultimately what this comes down to is a comprehensive solution to help prevent new homelessness to get people immediately off the street into humane and safe places while then transitioning them into intermediate housing options. And then for those who need it, helping them out to independence or into permanent supportive housing for long-term assistance. It is not housing first, it is not services first, it's all of it in an interlocking equation together. And our goal is not to be the end all be all, but rather coalescing more than 10,000 pages of materials and reports and interviews and studies in a way that the public can begin to react off of, in a way where we can navigate how we can concretely move from step one to step two to step three, informed by people on the streets, by frontline workers who are working with them, by nonprofits, by government entities, and by the public themselves. So that is a very high level moving quickly through that, uh, but being respectful of the Commission's time. Uh, and I'll pause there for any questions. Thank you. That's a wonderful uh, overview and an amazing roadmap uh, with uh, well thought out and data um, and suggestions that clearly, you know, is well needed. Uh, I, I noticed that uh, there was potential for 3,000 um, individuals um, at 1200 State Street. Um, I actually think you could probably um, house 5,000 um, individuals there easily. Um, it's amazing to me that that facility uh, was closed to, um, 12 years ago, um, and it's owned, it's plumbed, it has electricity, um, and, and yet with a crisis as you and the previous speaker and this commission has talked about for the last four years uh, of homelessness, um, that the, that facility ends up uh, underutilized. Um, so thank you for bringing that up. Um, I'll open it up to, for the commission to ask questions. Uh, we're totally honored that you come and, and, and um, give your uh, time to us uh, today. Um, and again, uh, for the commission's uh, uh, ideas uh, and thoughts, um, Craig is a volunteer um, doing this because he believes in the city of Los Angeles and he loves the city of Los Angeles. And, and I, personally, I applaud you for that. Um, Susie, um, Commissioner Shannon, you have a question. Um, hi, Craig. Thanks so much for coming tonight. Um, so I have just a few questions, um, and some of it just to clarify a few things. So I worked with our health population since 2005. There are some things that I agree with in your plan. There are some things that I don't. Um, and it's not because I like the system that we're in. I absolutely don't. I've been probably one of the biggest critics uh, of our current system. Um, however, there, there just are a few things that I want to clarify. Um, so this um, commission um, supports a Housing First model. Our, our first commission report um, basically embraced that and we, we voted for it. Um, 
And so when you, there was like a part earlier um, in your presentation when you were saying no drug use, addiction, it, it, treated, is that prior to people getting housing or is that after they get housed? So to be clear, we didn't, I didn't say anything about no drug use. Um, I said that we needed to provide services around addiction and recovery at every stage of folks' needs. Um, but the plan itself, the roadmap, doesn't stipulate uh, uh, something about no drug use. Um, we are firm believers that we need to meet each individual where they are in their level of need um, in terms of addiction and mental health. We believe that housing and services have to have it happen concurrently. We agree with the Commission's um, desire to make sure that everyone is housed, uh, but we need to make sure that everyone who's housed has services concurrent to that housing in that vein. Great. Okay. Yeah, because I saw that in there and I was like, okay, I'm not sure that I agree with that part, but that's good. Um, and then, so I've had many, many clients go into shelters and it's been um, not a great experience for almost all of them with the exception of a few. Um, and so I try to steer people to the shelters where I think um, they're more likely to stay. Um, we find that a lot leave or get kicked out. A lot of times it's because of these kind of um, rules like not being able to go to your car during the day, not being able to have hangers at your bed. Uh, in, one, in one instance, um, I had a client who petted someone's cat <laughs> and was kicked out for that even though they got permission ahead of time. Um, and so we find that shelters, particularly emergency shelters, um, are a revolving door back out into homelessness. Um, now we know we have about you know, shelter plus interim housing for about 35% of the 40,000 people who are in the city of Los Angeles. Um, we could have a little more than that, um, but for the most part, I feel like when somebody gets into a shelter, it's because someone else has left that shelter. And so we've got this revolving door kind of moving the deck chairs on the Titanic um, situation here. And um, so I want you, if you could speak to that, but also um, it's like adding the 13,000 emergency shelters. Um, and then you talked um, also about like kind of semi-private shelters. Um, you know, the CDC recommendation was that people not be moved into congregate shelter uh, for obvious reasons with the pandemic and um, the risk of, a, of transmission. Um, so wouldn't it be better to be moving more to the tiny homes, which I know is part of your plan, um, and just like leaving the emergency shelters alone <laughs> for now, um, since they may, you know, since people don't like them. They don't like them. They don't like the rules. They don't like the fact that they're in a larger room with a bunch of strangers. Um, they don't like the food. I mean, there's a myriad complaints that we could go through. So I'm wondering if you could address that. Yeah, so I'll try to break that into the two pieces, one of which is the easier. So uh, let me be very clear that uh, there's, there's the sheltering that we're talking about with semi-private beds. When we talk about uh, the 13,000, we're actually talking about um, emergency individual shelters that are similar to what FEMA would use. We're not talking about mass congregate shelters. Um, they are temporary, uh, designed to last no more than a year that can be uh, what we call drop zones. So you create, a, a, you know, you find, and there's, there's actually plenty of land in both Los Angeles City and Los Angeles County for this, uh, where you can immediately drop individual uh, parcels. So they operate like tiny homes. They just don't have the infrastructure of tiny homes, right? So they're, they're virtually identical in every respect, except that they are short-term emergency uh, FEMA-style usage, except they're not FEMA trailers, which are wildly expensive. Uh, but there are other, other similar options that are cost-effective. So that's what that 13,000 is. With regards to the 20,000 shelter-based beds in semi-private rooms, what we hear most often is not that people don't like the idea of shelters, it's that they don't like the policies that come with them or the, or the, the environment in which they find themselves. The concept of sheltering does work nationwide and works effectively in many cities. New York, uh, without providing long-term solutions, a substantial amount of overnight in sheltering for its homeless population in a very effective high-use uh, scenario. So the reality is that we advocate that these shelters, that, that it is possible to create shelters with semi-private rooms 
in that vein uh, that are that are cubicle style that I, I afford a measure of privacy, but also as a short term measure. We're not asking people to be there every night for a year, right? We're asking, we're moving people off the street to get them into those shelters, to get them the help that they need, while immediately transitioning them into intermediate options like tiny homes as soon as within, you know, if we're standing up these shelters, in, these mass congregate shelters in four to eight weeks, that's concurrent to we're starting to stand up intermediate housing that has longer term possibilities at six weeks to six months. So those things overlap with each other so that we're immediately being able to move people as soon as humanly possible from the larger shelter population to intermediate private uh, intermediate housing that's going to last anywhere up to, if you're using an emergency style in, in individual housing, uh, up to a year. But if you're using something that's non-emergency, up to three years, uh, for example, in, the, in tiny homes. But you know, knowing that the vast majority of folks are able to move out and transition to independence um, and, and uh, sustainable existence within six to nine months when given those opportunities. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, when you um, talk about the database matching people to housing, how is that different than the coordinated entry system? Which I find has not worked for even one of my clients. <laughs> Just, well, you, know. you, answered, you answered your own question in that vein. <laughs> it works, right? The idea is, I mean, if we can create uh, a system that is less burdensome, more accessible, with clarity as to what is available and where it's available in real time, we can do that in private enterprise. We can surely do that in, in, in this scenario as well with uh, our government resources, right? You're looking at something that's much more effective and simpler to use. So I would say more uh, hotel tonight and less coordinated entry system. Got it. Um, and then I think I had one final question. I don't know if you heard um, the speaker before this in some of my yeah. questions, but um, what about vacant units? Um, I, I mean, I do like the capping at 200000 for for units. Um, I'm guessing that would have to be prefab modular housing or adaptive reuse, which I'm a huge fan of um, and have been promoting that, I think, since 2015. Um, 200000 might be, I, I mean, I'm in the process of helping with one of these uh, projects. Um, and I think even Vigness came in at 220000 so we're close at least. Um, but what about the vacant units? What about what the, the stock and the inventory that we have now and the fact that it's underutilized. And, and I would say, too, I don't know if you've seen this, but in, um, in one of the city's reports, they have this graph that shows that we, based on the RENA numbers, um, which is our rental housing needs assess assessment for yeah. folks who don't know, um, we have overbuilt by 40,000 market rate in luxury units, and we have underbuilt by 40,000 affordable housing, and we have a little over 40,000 people who are unhoused. So <laughs> I think that that little graph that the city has provided to me sort of shows it all uh, in terms of what's going on. But um, yeah, if you could just um, um, answer that, you know, basically on the vacant units and our current inventory. Certainly. Well, our affordability and housing roadmap is coming out in a couple of weeks, which will address this comprehensively in the same manner and fashion in which we address the, the, the homelessness issue in this one. The issues are certainly intertwined. Um, in these situations, we like to trust economists because they have no uh, agenda for independent economists. So when we look at, the, you know, McKinsey, for example, uh, stipulates that 70% of Angelinas have to stretch to just make their rent, right? Like those numbers are unsustainable. Um, Economists also agree that Los Angeles doesn't fit the economic definition of a housing market. Uh, in order to have the economic definition of a market, there needs to be a relationship between supply and demand, and there is no relationship between supply and demand in Los Angeles, since only 13% of our housing has been built in the last 30 years. Um, and so what we see is, as a result of that, uh, disproportionate market forces that allow the creation of luxury units and incentivize the creation of luxury units and incentivize the creation of, uh, and the vacancy of luxury units because of the way the economics work around how we construct housing and how we build it. Uh, we are firm believers that 
it is the rightful place of government to step in and help facilitate a transition to a building to a world where we have an actual housing market, which means meeting everyone with inventory at their level that they can afford, right? So for folks at uh, marginal income levels or poverty levels, having enough inventory for them as well as enough inventory for everyone at every economic level. But that requires a comprehensive solution in housing, afford housing affordability that needs to happen in this city. It's part of the roadmap that we're uh, currently working on uh, and consulting with our experts on and experts across the, the city on, on how we do that and what timeline that takes. But the reality is until we solve that, uh, what we're doing with our homelessness solution is providing solutions that meet the problem we have not the problem of the future where we may or may not have solved for affordability. So we absolutely must do that. But, uh, we, and while these things are intertwined and entangled, they do have to be dealt with separately from, from our point of view. We don't want to hinge one on the other. Okay. And then um, I'd like to speak to some of the things that you had in here on enforcement. Um, one is, you know, you mentioned indecent exposure. Um, so the Health Commission has recommended based, based on the World Health Organization's um, recommendations um, to have one bathroom per 25 people who are unhoused, right? Um, and that, 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 those aren't what we're asking for. That's the World Health Organization. Um, it's basically saying you should have one toilet per 25 people. Um, so it seems like when you're talking about like indecent exposure, a lot of people on the street have no other choice but to, you know, go to the bathroom on the street because they don't have any other options. Um, and then and then on the enforcement and two, with the no camping um, rules, right, um, we have over 20,000 people where we don't have any shelter or interim housing, right? Um, we have actually m much more than that, being very conservative. So if we start banning people from different places, which is what sort of the new ordinance will do, but it's piecemeal, right, based on these um, uh, resolutions that will come before council, um, where are people supposed to go? So I hear you. You can't force people from someplace without giving them somewhere to go. What you're, what you're doing, though, is highlighting the problem without the solution, right? That's why we've put the comprehensive plan in place. That's why enforcement comes hand in hand with available inventory in our plan. The, that's why inventory gets stood up in under four weeks at the same time that, we, that enforcement begins within four weeks, right? We're not asking people to go someplace where we don't provide a place for them to go. And by that same token, right, you can't, you know, when we're saying, well, people who are currently on the street have no better option except to go to the bathroom in public, under our plan, they do. And so that allows us to create enforcement vehicles and enforcement mechanisms to hold anyone that we provide resources to, to the same standards as anyone else in the city. There can't be two set of standards for what is legal and permissible for the public versus the unhoused when we are providing resources for the unhoused to move off the streets. So I hear you, but in our plan, that enforcement comes hand in hand with all of the options that allow for those individuals to find the help and housing that they need. Yeah, I mean, the, the issue there, I would say, I mean, we'll, we'll have to agree to disagree on this, but the issue here is that in four weeks, you won't have over 20,000 um, units for people to go into or even the interim housing or any of that. So it seems like um, the enforcement piece is putting the cart before the horse. Um, I'm not a believer in, in criminalizing people um, just simply for not having a place to live. Um, and it seems like, you know, if there was uh, the eviction moratorium ends um, and people can't pay rent and they can't, for some reason, access that rental assistance, <clears throat> we're going to see um, greater than <laughs> over a little over 20,000 people who, who we simply don't have shelter or interim housing for. I mean, I just... I feel like we're not talking about 500 people without a place to go, and then we can offer them that within four weeks. This is, the, you know, in some cases, like a whole city worth of people who um, we literally have no space for. So 
I, I hear you on that, Dane. I will say that our plan comes with a comprehensive solution, including the 24-7 hotline to prevent homelessness with immediate financial resources. So we are planning for when the eviction moratorium expires, having a permanent solution in place that keeps people housed. So to say, well, we're not planning for it. We are. It's in there. The hotline is in there. I hear you. But the idea is that we're providing an easy-to-use solution. Regarding scalability, you're right. We'll have to agree to disagree. In speaking with engineers who are experienced in standing up the, these types of operations, the general consensus from them was that we can easily stand up and we have the space. In fact, in city-owned land alone, without needing to regrade any land, there's enough space for three million drop shelters without using one piece of public or recreational, uh, public recreational land. So the engineers on our side who have looked at the maps of the city and the land that's available, city-owned and city-controlled land, and who've talked to us about how they build in these situations globally, in much more hostile zones than, than, than Los Angeles, are confident that we can stand up 20,000 uh, within the time frame that we propose. We're not, here's the thing, we are not proposing anything new. We are taking solutions that already exist from people who have already implemented those solutions elsewhere and putting them together in a plan for Los Angeles. I understand that you disagree on that point, uh, but we stand by our numbers and our timeline. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Any other commissioners have uh, a question? Uh, Matt, uh, uh, Commissioner uh, Vice President uh, Grimming has a question. Uh, just a real quick question. I think it's a great plan, and thanks for coming to the commission tonight. As far as the uh, space, how much space is needed for um, the, the 20,000 units and then building the more permanent solutions that you mentioned? Um, I know you mentioned in LA we have enough for, I think you said 3 million a few minutes ago. Uh, which seems like a lot of, I don't know where that space might be, but in general for the, the plan that you're proposing, how much land is, I don't know if it's by square mile or, or what, but how much land is needed to, to house those folks? Um, intermediate housing on a, range, uh, on, a, on a basis range, so when we calculate that 3 million number, that is when we uh, allocate 263 square feet uh, per person, um, uh, that number comes substantially down if you can go up to 500 square feet per person. Uh, but obviously it's still substantially high, right? Even if we were to double that, we'd still be able to house uh, 1.5 million people at 500 square feet a person um, in, in intermediate housing. Um, I'll have to go back. It's not in our roadmap. I'll have to go back into our details and get back to you on the specific space, uh, space allocation in the emergency shelter-based housing with semi-private uh, facilities. And I'll get you, I can get you the square footage on that. Okay, no, that's great. And then the, you mentioned as far as space, um, that you've looked at and your engineers have looked at and, and uh, consultants and so forth. We're taking a look at the city of LA, but also the, the larger a county area of LA, correct? Yeah, so the city, uh, the, the city owned and controlled space can house up to 3 million people at 263 square feet per person. The county can house up to 21 million at that level. Okay, okay. And that's available space today available space that doesn't require regrading where you can have an immediate drop shelter, meaning you can have a prefabricated unit that drops in um, in under three days. Okay, no, that's great. That's great, what are next steps for, for you and the, the plan? <laughs> Uh, the first is rolling out the plan and then a series of public conversations around the plan. Our goal is really to get the public to see we're here to translate all the complex solutions that are out there for everyday Angelinos, right? So that when they come to the table, whether they come to the table now or in six months or six days before the, the coming election, that, that these solutions are available to them in a way that is digestible and easy to understand. Um, and then engaging in advocacy and awareness around that and public conversation around it. We'll be having a whole series of public conversations and events, including one with the, the alliance um, that's in the lawsuit with the city, for example, on, on September 9th, um, but certainly a series of public conversations where we reiterate that our plan isn't the only way, but it's a concrete way for people to see what's possible that would inform their votes in the coming elections to ideally support individuals who either, have, either support this plan or another concrete action plan that has real potential for movement forward and a timeline to which everyone can be held accountable. 
No, that's great. I mean, I think it's one of the few plans that at least when I've been on the commission for the last four years, that is a little bit more tangible and, and makes sense and is easy to understand. So well, good luck. No, thanks for coming. I appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. It's quite a pleasure to be here. And I'm, I'm deeply appreciative of the commission's time. Any other commissioners have a question for Craig? Um, seeing none, for the general public that's listening uh, to the commission meeting uh, or watching us, uh, uh, both pre presenters' uh, websites are on their slides, which are made uh, available uh, on our agenda. So you can go and get their uh, websites. You can look at uh, both their research uh, in, in the case of Dr. Uh, uh, Kuhn's. Um, and for Rise Together, you could go to their website. Uh, they have videos uh, available. They, their data is available. Uh, they are very transparent uh, in their approaches and their analysis. And I would advise everybody listening uh, throughout the city um, to go there and learn more uh, uh, about the great work that uh, UCLA's um, School of Public Health is doing to address uh, the healthcare issues of homeless people um, and the unhoused um, and rise together uh, their research as well as their proposal and their roadmap uh, to getting um, this problem solved within um, two years or three years. Um, so to, to you, um, I truly appreciate and we're honored that you come take your time to, to uh, join us today. Um, thank you for your, what you're doing, um, not only for um, healthcare, uh, but for the city of Los Angeles in general with your movement, uh, we truly appreciate your time and efforts. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, moving on to the next uh, agenda item. Um, uh, will the, the um, uh, at our last meeting, uh, we discussed uh, the nominations uh, for leadership of the commission. Um, I'm asking to see if there's uh, any other individuals in the commission who uh, would want to be self-nominated or have somebody to nominate them for any of the leadership positions. Seeing none, um, could the city clerk then Looking again, um, any other commissioners want to either self-nominate or have somebody nominate them for one of the leadership positions? Seeing none, then we have three individuals uh, up for positions uh, with no opposition. Um, you have the ability to vote uh, uh, yay, nay, or abstain. Uh, I would ask the uh, city clerk to uh, uh, call for uh, the vote. Thank you, Commissioner. And the city attorney has advised that we need to take three separate votes on the three different motions. So the first motion was by Grimick Sarota to nominate Commissioner Howard Mandel for president of the commission. So Commissioner Avila, how do you vote? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Gavidia? Yes. Thank you. Commissioner Grimick? Yes. Commissioner Hissarik? Yes. Commissioner Kalfani. Yes. Commissioner Mandel. Yes. Commissioner Ossie. Yes. Commissioner Shannon. Yes. Commissioner Sarota. Yes. Nine ayes. This motion passes. Thank you. The next motion, Mandel Hissarik, was to nominate Commissioner Matt Grimmick for the first vice president position. Commissioner Avila? Yes. Commissioner Gavidia? Yes. Commissioner Grimmick? Yes. Commissioner Hissarik? Yes. Commissioner Kofani? Yes. Commissioner Mandel? Yes. Commissioner Ossie? Yes. Commissioner Shannon? Yes. Commissioner Sarota? Yes. Nine ayes. This motion passes. And the last motion, Mandel Hissarik, to nominate Commissioner Shamika Asi for second vice president of the Health Commission. 
Commissioner Avila? Yes. Commissioner Gavidia? Yes. Commissioner Grimmick? Yes. Commissioner Hisserick? Yes. Commissioner Clafani? Yes. Commissioner Mandel? Yes. Commissioner Ossie? Yes. Commissioner Shannon? Yes. Commissioner Sorota? Yes. Nine ayes. This motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm um, thrilled to, to have the uh, uh, Vice President and Second Vice President continue in their position. Um, we truly appreciate um, their efforts as well as uh, all the efforts of all the commissioners um, to help improve the health of the City of Los Angeles. Thank you. Um, moving on to the uh, next agenda item, uh, new business. Any individuals have uh, something they want us to address? Um, we will be doing um, a September meeting where there are several individuals who are experts on, on, on COVID uh, who will be, uh, who have been already asked to present. Um, and then uh, we will also, um, by the end of this month, um, have uh, a working first draft of our um, annual report that will be made available individually to um, each commissioner um, and with the plan that we have some time to have your input uh, on the work and then have it uh, presented um, at the uh, October um, uh, meeting with the uh, hope that we can then have a final approval uh, by November um, and have it uh, published uh, by December of 2021. Um, the uh, October meeting we would expect would have uh, a uh, speaker or two and then a presentation from uh, our research associates uh, on the um, entire report um, so that uh, there can be an open discussion um, of the report. Um, any other um, uh, issues that people want to have addressed um, either in September, October, or November, um, or even moving past through December? Are there uh, other issues that people want to have uh, uh, evaluated and addressed? I'm seeing no hands. Um, you always have the ability to um, contact the uh, uh, city clerk to, to reach out um, to, to me as well as um, to um, our three excellent uh, research associates, um, um, Sarah, Lauren, and, and Marvin. Um, you have the ability as a commissioner to directly reach out to the three of them together or one individual uh, on, on any issue that you would like to have evaluated and, and researched. Um, and um, um, you can reach out to individual commissioners However, remember the Brown Act, you cannot email uh, more than 50% of the uh, individuals at any time. Uh, Commissioner Shannon, looks like your hand's up. Sorry, I forgot to unmute. Um, I know that Commissioner Cotto has spoken a few times about um, having someone from the city come and address us on homeless issues. Um, and I recommended, I think a couple months ago, that um, Matt Zabo is coming in as the new CAO, um, uh, sort of let us know his thoughts on where things are and um, how to meet these challenges. So if we can at some point um, get him scheduled in for commission meeting, that would be great. Well, we, we would definitely accommodate him um, with his position and busy schedule. Um, if you have a, a good contact um, or you have the ability, if you know him, to reach out to him directly, uh, you're more than welcome to, to reach out to him. I don't think that, you know, it's been discussed beforehand. Uh, we, we would love to have senior city officials um, come to the commission. Um, in that light also, I think that uh, we've asked uh, numerous leadership uh, members uh, of the uh, L.A. County Department of Public Health, uh, the L.A. County um, Hospital and, and Health System, uh, and... Um, uh, repeatedly have gone to them 
um, and have not been successful. Um, their feeling is that they're um, really busy with the pandemic, uh, but we continue to, to go after them and, and request um, their um, um, uh, attending our meeting and presenting to us and, and discussing issues. Uh, we've also attempted to, to go to the state to talk about um, uh, hospital beds and, and uh, have had a hard time getting Oshpod uh, to respond to us as well. Uh, but we'll continue trying because I do think it's important um, to have leadership um, come here and discuss uh, what's going on in regards to uh, public health problems of, of the city of Los Angeles. But um, yeah, if you can get Matt, that'd be fantastic. I don't, I don't have a connection to him, but if you do, we'd love to have him present. Great. Thank you. Any other commissioners? No other, uh, you're always welcome to, to reach out to the research associates. Uh, I um, uh, thank you very much for um, all your work uh, on the commission um, and uh, to the um, members of the public who are listening, uh, please get vaccinated. Uh, if you don't understand um, the rationale for it, uh, please um, contact your individual physician, uh, if you have one, uh, to have them discuss with you uh, on a personal basis um, or uh, reach out to the commission and uh, we'll try to give you the data or information you might need to convince you to get vaccinated for your own well-being. Uh, currently, uh, in the city of Los Angeles, 98% uh, of the hospitalizations are people who are unvaccinated. Um, this is something that you could avoid um, vaccination, 22% of the people who are hospitalized uh, end up in ICU care. A significant percentage of those individuals are intubated, meaning having a, a plastic tube uh, placed down into their uh, uh, main bronchus uh, to breathe for them because they don't have the strength or ability to get enough oxygen into the bloodstream. Um, this is avoidable. Um, this is, is something you can avoid by getting vaccinated. So if everybody in the city of Los Angeles or the county who's listening to this commission um, please um, get vaccinated. Um, if you're not sure or you're worried, um, there are resources. Um, there are uh, your individual physician, if you have one. There are county or free clinics or public health centers, community health centers that are available to help um, educate you uh, and explain to you on an individual basis why you should get vaccinated. Um, the county website and the city website um, has uh, uh, other information um, as does the CDC. So there, there's a lot of resources to, to uh, help convince you to do something that uh, we believe um, is in your best interest to keep you safe. So um, uh, thank you all. Um, is there a motion for adjournment? Sure, I'll make the motion, Ms. John and Ms. Uh, is there a second? Second. Uh, all right, so this, uh, Commissioner Shannon, second. Uh, um, all in favor of uh, adjourning, say aye. 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 Anybody opposed? <laughs> Anybody abstaining? No, uh, we're actually adjourned. Thank you very much for your, your, your time, commissioners. I appreciate your dedication and volunteerism to help the city of Los Angeles. Thank you. Erica, Thank you. I did ask you if you could email me something. I'd appreciate okay. it. Okay.